Welcome to the SVA Theater. My name is Isabel Taubi, and I teach art history in the BFA Honors and also the Visual and Critical Studies programs here at the School of Visual Arts. I'm very pleased to introduce Richard Schiff, who will lecture on modes of distraction this evening. First, I want to thank him for his willingness to reschedule his talk, which was canceled like many other things due to Hurricane Sandy. And second, I want to thank Tom Hoon, the head of the Visual and Critical Studies program, for inviting Professor Schiff to come speak to us tonight. And I should also mention that this program is sponsored by the BFA Visual and Critical Studies Department. Richard Schiff holds the Effie Marie Kane Regents Chair in Art and directs the Center for the Study of Modernism at the University of Texas in, at Austin. His research and scholarship includes theory and criticism and art historical studies in the field of modern art from the early 19th century to contemporary art. He received his BA from Harvard University and his MA and PhD from Yale. He has received numerous grants and fellowships, notably a Getty Senior Research Grant, a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship, and a National Humanities Center Fellowship. He has too many publications to even begin to mention them all here. So I've selected a very few to give you a sense of the range of his interests. Cezanne and the End of Impressionism, Critical Terms for Art History, which he co-edited, Barnett Newman, a catalog raisonné, which he co-authored, Doubt, which focuses on Judd, Newman, de Kooning, Cezanne, and Rousseau, and the varieties of doubt he perceived in their work, and most recently, Between Sense and de Kooning. He also has contributed essays to numerous museum catalogs, including Vincent van Gogh, Up Close at the National Gallery of Canada, Cezanne and Beyond at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and Marlene Dumas, Measuring Your Own Grave at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles. While many of us may know him best for his interpretation of painting, he also has written essays about photography and the relationship between painting and photography, which I believe he'll address in tonight's talk. Richard Schiff's contributions significantly extend beyond his publications. He is a celebrated teacher and mentor, and he received the prestigious Distinguished Teaching of Art History Award from the College Art Association in 2010. What distinguishes Richard Schiff's work for me is his repeated questioning of classifications and concepts that close down interpretation or theory that leads to generalizations, and his attentiveness to the experience of the individual artist. Unlike many art historians who seem to have left the artist behind in their pursuit of art history, Richard Schiff is an art historian who gives the artist primacy, attending to the particularities of their work and experience, as he himself elaborated in an interview in the Brooklyn Rail, quote, I have to mold my writing to aspects of their character rather than try to convert them into me, end quote. I now hope that you will join me in welcoming Richard Schiff to SVA. Thanks very much, Isabel, for that very kind introduction. Um, can I have the light on me a little dimmer than it is? Great. You never know who will show up in a lecture hall, so it's hard to estimate what content would be appropriate. Some months ago, I asked Tom Hewn what he thought, and he said that at an art school, it's good to show works of art. So work of art. <laughs> then somewhat later I mentioned to a colleague in New York that I might feature a particular artist whose work I enjoy discussing. She replied, well, you like that artist, but nobody else does. So I scratched that idea. During the past few years, I've been writing more about living artists than about historical figures. But I'm an easily distracted person, and as a kind of self-analysis, I've been writing a bit about the history of associating modern art not only with abstraction, 
but also with distraction. Distraction of the senses as well as the mind. It's not so much that art distracts its viewers, but it does do that. I'm interested instead in the possibility that artists may be distracted people, or they may produce their work in a state of distraction. Of course, it's not easy to know what distraction is because sometimes it feels like a form of concentrated attention, a redirection of attention, while at other times it seems like inattention. In any case, to approach, approach this topic, I decided to return to historical figures primarily, and this entails that the abstract art that I'll feature will be mostly the representational kind. So I'll be talking about Paul Cezanne, Vincent van Gogh, and the recently deceased Cy Twombly, along with a few others thrown in. Initially, I titled this lecture, Modes of Distraction, and it was to have a photographic section, uh, as Isabel said, although that's largely gone. And perhaps a more appropriate title might be Abstraction Saved from Distraction. In November 1895, at age 56, Cezanne emerged from relative obscurity to become a focus of avant-garde Parisian interest. It happened because an ambitious art dealer, Amboise Vallard, took the advice of a number of Cezanne's admirers among younger generations of artists. With the cooperation of Cezanne's son, who was then in his 20s, Vallard featured Cezanne's paintings in a sequence of well-publicized gallery displays. Cezanne was a reluctant art world hero and seems to have had little, if any, direct participation in the events that brought him fame. He disliked Parisian society. Whenever he was in the city, he made himself invisible. A century later, museums in Paris, London, and Philadelphia commemorated Volar's groundbreaking exhibition with a major Cezanne retrospective. During the intervening decades, numerous scholars and critics had argued that Cezanne, who had been thoroughly committed to representational painting, ought to be regarded as one of the founders of 20th century abstract art. For the catalog of the 1995 retrospective, it fell to Joseph Rischel, one of the organizing curators, to write about the artist's drawing practice, as, as we see in this sketchbook page. Rischel called attention to a curious feature of Cezanne's sketchbooks, those that contain drawings from the years corresponding to the boyhood of Cezanne's son when the child was around five or six occasionally contains supplemental sketching that gives the impression of a child's intervention. There are also entire pages given over to juvenile attempts at rendering, such as this one. And here are the two together. In this particular interest, I instance, the son's drawing faces a completed representation by the father on the opposing page of the bound sketchbook, a case of direct imitation. Rischel's way of imagining the circumstances is interesting. Quote, Cezanne would occasionally turn a sketchbook over to his son as a means of distraction, or in some cases, instruction, as in these two facing pages, where the son clearly set out to copy his father's view of a house and trees with fading industry. So here we, have a a here we have distraction as an alternative to instruction and industry. The curator need hardly say more to support his judgment of fading industry. He infers as much because Cezanne's carefully spaced hatchings, the very sign of visual attention and hand-to-eye coordination, have become the son's scribbles. And when we compare the scribbles at the left of the son's copy to those of the right in the same drawing, we conclude that whatever industriousness and precision the son may have been able to muster was indeed diminishing. The positioning of the various groups of scribbles corresponds, albeit, albeit very loosely, 
to the configuration of Cezanne's own groups of marks. But from left to right, the correspondence lessens. A loss of attention is the obvious inference. The curator's phrase, fading industry, implies a decrease in productivity. But what is the product, the one that's fading away? What is it that dissipates, disintegrates, or merely becomes irrelevant, displaced in the field of attention by some other object of attention, or of inattention, of distraction? The product is not the drawing marks themselves because they continue on across the entire sheet. It's not the activity because this also continues, and perhaps the pace even quickens, and if it does, then perhaps it becomes still more energetic. When we speed up a process, we might either be losing interest or becoming more deeply involved. What seems to have faded in this drawing is the direct correspondence between the copy and its model. The attention may remain strong, but is being directed away from copying as if the son were inadvertently leading his reluctant father toward the inauguration of an art of the medium, an abstract art in which the demands of the medium dominate those of the representational model. To a great extent, this is what the Paris of 1895, 15 or 20 years after these drawings were made, wanted from Cezanne himself. The younger generation, especially Paul Gauguin, the oldest among them, enlisted Cezanne to justify their own experimentation with extending the expressive potential of the medium. Gauguin accentuated his colors and stressed the directness, the no-nonsense character of his brushwork, as in this still life. He was emulating paintings by Cezanne that looked like this and like this and small studies that looked like this. As far as Cezanne was concerned, the directness of his own effect, which Gauguin specifically called abstract, had arrived as an unwelcome byproduct of his attempt to capture the sensory feel of his various subjects. Each mark was a kind of tactile snapshot of his sensation, as opposed to a continuous scanning of an optical field. This is why Cezanne's pictures looked fragmentary and incomplete to many of his initial viewers. The brush strokes remained distinct from each other, yet by resembling each other, sensation after sensation, they failed to vary in accord with the diverse qualities of the scene. The marks broke away from the control of the representational theme. It may seem to us as if Cezanne painted seven distinct apples, but to some of his early viewers, he was painting the same apple over and over because the strokes were the same. He could no longer observe the apples. The strokes were so strong that the apples, as a theme, began to disappear. As I've said, it's clear that from Cezanne's perspective, a result of this kind would be inadvertent. To talk about the marks as Gauguin did and others did, or to, br to uh, begin to say that it hardly mattered what Cezanne was painting, commentary of this type, later to be associated with formalist criticism, was a distraction from what Cezanne thought he was accomplishing the presentation of an image that expressed his personal experience of nature. Not a view of art, but a view of nature. During his final years, Cezanne complained that his contemporaries were imitating art instead of imitating nature. But a critic might counter that Cezanne himself 
had been distracted by the paint. Like some kind of materialist minimalist, he had been experiencing no more than the paint. Let's return to what had happened to Cezanne's son. His situation entails an irony. Apparently, he had become distracted from what had been intended as his means of distraction. The task of copying was supposed to have kept him mentally and physically occupied. And this is what the curator, Joseph Rischel, meant by calling sketching a means of distraction. So distraction, just like abstraction, can refer either to holding attention or to losing attention. When Cezanne's son experienced mental distraction, this was an ordinary process of feeling and thinking in which one sensation or thought distracted from or displaced another. Human minds do wander. It seems that Cezanne's son became bored with the task at hand, which was to make an accurate rendering. Would the situation have turned out differently if the boy had been making an abstraction, if he had been drawing a kind of absent-minded doodle for which no standard of accuracy applies. In Cezanne's era, many believed that to think in abstractions, for example, like a philosopher, would lead to mental distraction. Abstract thinking would distance people from utilitarian ends from their occupation or industry. And today, it's still commonly argued that an art of abstract forms and colors, like speculative abstract philosophy or pure experimental science, addresses no practical problems. That abstract philosophy, abstract science, and abstract art communicate nothing and serve no purpose other than the luxury of distraction. This is a real issue, or at least real enough to become an occasional topic for a distracting form of representational art. I introduced this recent painting by Georg Baselitz as an amusing illustration. It shows a famous image of Lenin but upside down because this is the way that Baselitz satisfies his desire to produce an art that's neither properly representational nor properly abstract. The crux of this painting is its combination of a pointillist technique and a reference to Soviet social planning. Here the pointillism is very crude because Baselitz is using a bottle cork to make the marks. These marks are so blatant that in many areas it's hard to follow the representation. Perhaps this is appropriate. Soviet social planning was also crude. It was a coarsely abstract theory that didn't work well in satisfying real human needs. Well, pointillism didn't work either, or so Baselitz thinks. Its five-year plan to put order into art was no more successful than Lenin's plan to put order into society. So Baselitz combines the social abstraction with the painterly abstraction, referring to the parallel failures of two theories that were too abstract. Baselitz's thinking is a bit quirkier than I've just presented it, but let's take his Lenin picture as a critique of abstraction in painting. To be fair, we now need a defense of abstraction. I'll introduce Frank Stella for this, quoting some remarks of his from the late 1970s. When Stella makes reliefs in metal, he often scribbles with paint on the aluminum forms. He regards these scribble marks as assertions of physical presence, the reality of the substance of whatever image results. His scribbles are like Baselitz's quirk marks, but with a different intention. Here's what he has said, and this is a relatively long quotation. 
It's not the presence of a recognizable figure that in itself makes things real, but the ability to project the image and to have it be so physical, so painted. It's so aggressively painted that it bursts out into image. And that image has a sense of being real, of breaking through pictorial boundaries to coexist in our everyday space. For me, painting these metal reliefs is a way of infusing the piece with life. Abstraction has to be made real. To the extent that the abstract image has to be infused with a physical pictorial presence, abstraction has, in some curious sense, not to be abstract. That's the end of the quote. So Stella implies that a representation, because it's only an image, and therefore once removed from tactile reality, must be an abstraction. But the, his abstract scribbling is entirely real. It's what it is and represents nothing outside itself. Scribbling would make of the aluminum abstraction something real, more than just a distracted scribble. Ironically, to have its effect of reality, the scribble has to be independent of the other features of the work. It has to be abstracted out from these other features and perhaps distracted from them. This notion of Stella's, that you reach reality through abstraction, or rather through something that seems so meaningless that it becomes a mere distraction, this is very much like Roland Barthes' literary theory of the effect of the real, and I'll return to this theory at a later point. Now, back to the time of Cezanne, shared by Van Gogh. Many thought that his art, like Cezanne's, was too abstract. Sometimes, even Van Gogh thought this but usually in the sense of his ideas becoming too abstract. What did looking abstract, as opposed to thinking abstract, entail? It meant that you fixed on, you became distracted by, the material qualities of the picture without passing on to the referential details of the subject matter. Frank Stella would provide no referential details, but Van Gogh's art was all about reference. As I've already indicated, Gauguin was very conscious of the tension between the two effects. On his part, he actively cultivated the appearance of abstraction for the sake of direct expression. Does the shadow look rather blue, he asked in 1888 then don't be afraid to paint it as blue as you can. In other words, extract or abstract the blueness of the blue. Use your blue, your red, your green, not for fidelity, but for the effect, as in Gauguin's still life on the right, which we've already seen. Perhaps Van Gogh had done the same with his irises in a vase, blue, green, and yellow. In 1888, he too spoke of intentionally intensifying his colors. Now, Van Gogh was involved with easel painting, which by its nature is a solitary activity. The concentration that painting requires focuses and isolates the painter's attention. Let's imagine him standing, Van Gogh standing with his easel, along a roadway at the edge of a cultivated field just beyond the city of Arles. He filled his canvas with marks that looked abstract to many others. But when reflecting on his practice, he said that he ordered these marks in the direction of the objects. Those were his words, in the direction of the objects. We can think of this process in at least two ways. 
and in doing so, we recreate the interpretive dilemma that critics of the time faced. From one critical perspective, in the direction of the objects, means that Van Gogh was a naturalist registering the forms of depicted things, imitating form by a corresponding directional stroke. For example, if there was a drainage ditch by the side of the road, the painter's marks would mimic the scooping of the earth to reveal the interior contour of the depression in the ground. But from an opposing critical perspective, the direction of the objects would be no more of an abstract feeling than an empirical observation. The thought would be this. Van Gogh was developing an emotionally charged idealization or conceptualization of a scene. The objects took a certain direction because the artist gave it to them. The depicted image would become the form and feeling projected into the scene. I don't think that Van Gogh wanted to choose between these alternatives. He seems to have reacted against either one of these positions whenever someone became too strongly its advocate. The actual practice of painting was an absorbing felt activity. Analysis and theorization were parallel activities, but did not determine Van Gogh's practice. When he felt himself becoming ill or agitated, painting, he said, was his remedy. Quote, work distracts me infinitely better than anything else. Distraction for Van Gogh is an important issue, as it was for many of his contemporaries. I'm struck by a comment Van Gogh made one evening in 1888, that same year. Quote, when I sit down to write, I'm so distracted by recollections of what I've seen while painting that I leave the letter, abandon the writing, in other words. But here, I've not been quite true to Van Gogh's factual record. He didn't refer in this instance to distraction, although this is what he must have intended. Writing in English to an Australian friend, Van Gogh substituted the word abstracted for the word distracted. His command of English was excellent, but this is an easy mistake to make for a non-native speaker because the words and their concepts overlap. Van Gogh had actually written, quote, I'm so abstracted by recollections of what I've seen that I leave the letter. To be sure, there are connotative differences. Abstraction removes inessential features of either an object or an intellectual construction. Abstraction is a process of simplifying the given condition, reducing a situation to fundamentals, enabling a more focused attention. This is why critics thought that Cezanne's uh, marks, shown on the right, were more abstract than Van Gogh's on the left. They were left less varied, therefore more reductive, even more purely mark-like, mere strokes, like Stella's scribbles. They presented the essence of the mark of paint, not the essence of the object depicted. Because Cezanne reduced representation to the point that it became materiality, his form of abstraction was distracting. Abstraction gathers a person's attention and perhaps turns it in a certain direction. But distraction itself is abrupt. It separates attention from its object by suddenly, even violently, directing it elsewhere. I, uh, sorry, I got out of order. Um, I have actually meant to show this pair first uh, because the Cezanne mark is, is really more evident in that particular picture, but it's Van Gogh versus Cezanne and then Van Gogh versus Cezanne again. 
We often associate what we call experience with a shift in the order of things, a reorientation or break in attention. We say I had an interesting experience today, implying that something unusual happened, that we were drawn out of our narrative pattern. In this regard, experience is itself distracting. The philosopher C.S. Peirce, who belonged to Cezanne's generation, compared the feeling of genuine experience to having been abruptly removed from one world to another. As he put it, quote, my blue life becoming transputed into red life. I often feel that Van Gogh's paintings have the inherent distraction of sensory experience built into them, just as Cezanne's do. Cezanne noticed that if he merely turned his head slightly to either side while remaining fixed on the outdoor scene he was rendering, an independent motif appeared. He realized that he could stay in the same limited area indefinitely without running out of views to represent. Perhaps he did turn his head before finishing, and this is why so many of his works include features that appear inconsistent with any fixed perspective. Each internal aspect of each general view distracts from another. So just because I, I'm not sure how I got out of sequence, but yes, there is the uh, Van Gogh and the um, detail, and then Van Gogh and Cezanne, and to repeat that Cezanne um, is a very straightforward view, but it's notable for uh, its mark-like quality, and it was owned by Gauguin. It was one of the pictures that he picked because it had that kind of marking in it. And then uh, a more expansive view like this where Cezanne is elevated and looking out over the Bay of Lestoc is the type of view where he tends to very often to incorporate more into the picture than you really think ought to be there in terms of the perspective. I think in Cezanne's case of those odd painterly gestures that make no representational sense, yet remain thoroughly visible in the representational picture. In this still life, a blatant stroke of pale blue borders the central green apple. It violates the order of foreground and background by being inconsistent with both. And it also breaks the contour of the table in an incoherent manner. What the stroke does, however, is to move in the direction of the object. If I may insert Van Gogh's self-analysis into the work of Cezanne. The problem for representation is that the stroke, in this case, lies outside the object. I suspect that here felt sensation is taking over distracting the painter from any other purpose. Cezanne allows this marking event to happen as if he were so distracted by the rhythms of his own process and the feel of his materials that he loses any capacity to override the abstraction. In Van Gogh's case, an analogous experiential distraction seems recorded in the surface of his pair of shoes of 1888. He applies two different methods to render the shadows. Besides the sh beside the shoe at the left side of the picture, a cast shadow becomes a relatively solid mass of gray, probably a mixture of the reds, yellows, and blues that appear throughout the canvas. So that's uh, right over there. This shadow remains in its proper pictorial position. To the contrary, the cast shadow at the right projects out from its shoe to a much greater extent, and it does so with a sequence of directional marks, as if, again, to move in the direction of the object. Van Gogh probably added at least some of these marks, wet into wet, after he had painted the colors of the floor tiles. In the immediate proximity of the edge of the shoe, the shadow appears coordinated with the contour, as are the touches of pale color indicating the flooring. But farther out, the two systems diverge. 
we have the impression of an echoing sound or a wave of energy. That is, Van Gogh's shadow marks correspond to our graphic imagination of such invisible phenomena. It doesn't matter which phenomenon the shadow matches as a visualization of the invisible. Van Gogh's sequence of blue marks animates the play of light and shade, but this animation belongs to his hand, neither to the light nor to the shoe, and it generates a force of its own. We regard this distracting element as distraction. Now, there's something about all that I've been saying that rubs against the cultural grain. Haven't we learned that concepts are abstractions and generalities, whereas colors and material marks are concrete particulars? Don't we associate abstraction with the intellect, the intellect, not only with reason, but also with imagination and fantasy? Why is it that sensory experience can generate abstraction just as readily and without any theory to guide it. We may be confusing abstraction and distraction. That's my point, of course. But then everybody used to experience this confusion, and everybody still does. We resort to the terms abstract and abstracted to describe the mental state of a thoroughly distracted person. Here's a difference to keep in mind. Distraction is something that we can feel. We know when we're distracted, or at least we can recall the experience after the fact because we've registered a change. The change might even be a loss, but we know that we've lost one state of awareness and gone into another. What Cezanne's early viewers perceived as the abstract character of his mark, we might today write off as a form of representation. I wouldn't be surprised if some art historian interpreted Cezanne's curving blue stroke as representing the aura of the green apple. This would attach a reassuring representation to the abstraction. We don't like to leave blatant material abstraction hanging. It's too distracting. We need a reason for the mark. I think that Cezanne's initial viewers found his art disturbing because its features were evident enough, but they had no readily available theory to explain them. Art historians spent the following century trying out one theory after another. I would venture the concept that Cezanne himself ventured and simply attribute his marks to personal sensation. Ordinary sensation is itself distracting. Cezanne used this term in its colloquial reference to sensory feeling rather than with some refined philosophical significance. In the case of Van Gogh, I don't want to deny his intellect or slight his interest in conceptualization. Rational thought founded his art just as physical sensation did. He sought to experience their convergence. This would occur in the form of an emotion that shared qualities of abstract thought and concrete sensation. In Arles, again in 1888, when portraying his friend, the artist Eugène Bosch, Van Gogh decided that he would, quote, express the thought of a forehead through the radiance of a light tone on a dark background. Van Gogh's aim was representational, perhaps allegorical. To intensify the tonal contrast, he thickened the surface of the figure's temple by adding an amount of pale, flesh-colored pigment. It's probably, uh, where's my red mark? It's probably thicker than it looks in the, uh, in the image, but it's, uh, it's very noticeable. 
Van Gogh is expressing the presence of immaterial thought by means of physical matter. It remained to determine how much substance would be enough to generate the appropriate sensation, the feel of concentrated thinking. If Van Gogh took the material too far, its presence would distract from the abstract signification of the theme, the theme of Bosch as a poetic intellectual. To put the question crudely, how much of a lump could the flesh-colored paint become before reducing immaterial thought to utterly nonverbal material nonsense? When would the paint itself become excessive, an abstraction that distracted the viewer from the subject? In Van Gogh, critics perceived the threat that the pictorial marks and colors of artists might be so intense that art in general would become discursively incoherent. This was the initial risk of abstraction in art, the kind of abstract art that still had representational elements in it, like Cezanne's pictures of apples or a portrait by Van Gogh. People would no longer care what the subject was. Art would become decorative and hedonistic rather than socially responsible and instructive. Cezanne outlived Van Gogh by 16 years. When he died in 1906, his art was the embodiment of what critics called the loss of subject. As I've suggested, such loss occurred when artists became distracted and even overwhelmed by the marks they were making. So how does the situation look after the subject has been lost for over a century? Naturally, there are many possible answers to this question. Some would simply say, what's the problem? We still have a multitude of forms of representational art. Yet our culture of images and signs has changed. Despite the dematerialization of the image in forms of electronic representation, we may have become all the more sensitive to the material qualities of signs. I'll approach this issue by considering some of the art of Cy Twombly. <clears throat> the painting on the screen, like many of Twombly's works, sets a name against a relatively amorphous image that comes into greater focus because of the suggestiveness of the name. If we're still worried about the loss of subject, Twombly seems to be saying, worry no more, the name, the word, will reveal the subject. But here the word, Leandro, is a prominent compositional element of the picture. Of course, the, uh, well, yeah, it's pretty, pretty obvious. There is the word. The word, uh, this word relates to, to Twombly's smears of red and green paint, which may be mere abstractions, resembling a kind of childish doodling or just a play. Uh, Twombly uh, normally uses his fingers, not a brush, to um, make a painting like this, so he's messing with the paint. By a kind of pictorial infectiousness, the name of Leandro, the mythical figure who drowned in the sea, causes Twombly's smears to become convincing as a watery wave despite the incongruous color. And even the lumbering slant of Twombly's handwriting as he inscribes the name Leandro seems coordinated with the putative wave which bears the weight of the name along with it as if the name this physical imprint of lettering or script were the body, the corpse of Leandro. The paint, along with the coarse character of the handwriting, poeticizes this inscription all the more by incorporating it as an active pictorial element. The writing becomes more than just the abstract, dematerialized designator of the person Leandro or Leander. The writing seems to be something floating on the sea, 
perhaps about to be submerged in the wave. This is the nature of a constructed picture. Every element becomes something more than what it is in itself, even the written name. <clears throat> the name is more than a title. It's a set of physical marks. But the mark-like nature of the name distracts from its abstract or conceptual meaning. So it isn't clear whether the sum of Twombly's art represents a gain or enhancement of the theme of Leander or represents some kind of intellectual loss because of the potential confusion of material and conceptual elements. Twombly's painted surfaces contain arrays of marks that look like little more than marks. <coughs> Ciphers, smudges, smears, jottings, little figurations, nothing taken too seriously. But it's typical for Twombly to assign a name to a picture, in this case, Bacchus. The collage of grapes adds a redundant reference to the god of wine or Bacchic uh, hedonism and becomes a clue to the meaning of the form above, a vaguely triangular mass of smears of red, blue, and purple. We have grape-like colors, a bunch-like shape, but no bunch of grapes. With Twombly's art, we're caught between saying that the marks are becoming more explicitly conceptual like words, or the words are becoming more explicitly material like marks. As for Twombly's handwriting, it's sometimes very hard to read it. Here the entire painting consists of the distribution of figured marks that happen to be Greek letters spelling Orpheus. Yet the name doesn't seem to conjure up this particular uh, surface of marks in the way that grapes and perhaps even the blue, red, and purple smears of color in the previous painting might be conjured up by Bacchus. In the Orpheus painting, there is little or no thematic connection. Here, writing signifies only in the most general sense, indiscriminately suggesting the entirety of the culture that produced the myth of Orpheus. We're witnessing a strange cultural and pictorial inversion. If Cezanne was among the first to lose the subject by becoming overly distracted by the marks, then Twombly is among those later figures who regain a subject by force of will through immersion in graphic forms that may not signify anything in particular. If this is Orpheus, okay, then it's Orpheus. Some of Twombly's well-known paintings connote writing by the character of their linear forms. Others, like the Orpheus painting, actually present some writing. I wonder whether the critics of abstract art feel relieved when they encounter the example of Twombly, I mean the, by the critics of abstract art, those who don't like abstract art whether they feel relieved when they encounter the example of Twombly because it's so easy to find the subject and then talk about the cultural significance of myth, avoiding all the rest. At the least, in Twombly's art, we avoid certain Cezanne-like perceptual problems. I remember visiting a Chuck Close show a few years ago. There was a mother with her young child nearby and the child asked of this painting, why does the man have so many colors on his face? This naive but perfectly understandable question arose because a viewer will imagine the same face rendered in a more conventional manner without so many colors. But without the colors, there's no face. Just as without the red, blue, and purple smears, Twomley has no bunch of grapes. And without the rectilinear strokes of red and green, Cezanne has no apples, round as they are. Do I need to add that Twombly takes the same red and green of Cezanne and gets the Mediterranean Sea out of it? 
As theory has always told us, signs are arbitrary. In this example from Lucian Freud, it's easy enough to say that the background area of the painting represents the studio wall on which Freud, for years, deposited smears of unused paint. But what of the figure's hair? Is there a meaningful difference in the way that paint is used to represent paint and the way that it represents hair? This type of question may not have been an issue in understanding Freud, but it was a big problem for the appreciation of Cezanne and Van Gogh, especially when viewers noticed that the flat parts of Cezanne's views, such as the wallpaper in the backgrounds of his still lifes, looked just as boldly paint-like as the foreground apples did. If this painting is to fit the conventional genre of still life, it should be saying something either about domestic life and its pleasures or about the vanity of such pleasures. Then why is the wallpaper so prominent? We sense that Cezanne could not keep his eyes off this aspect of the view, which meant he couldn't keep his hands off when painting the picture. The wallpaper distracted him from the apples. This is where we come back to the question of the reality effect or the effect of the real that I mentioned at an earlier point. According to Roland Barthes or according to Frank Stella, what makes us feel as if we're in the midst of reality is the intrusion of random sensory feelings and of a sense of objects that have no assigned meaning relative to the context. If there were not these intrusions, we'd be living in a fully coherent narrative, as if our existence had been programmed either by our own understanding or by an understanding imposed by someone else. The someone else might be culture. Within a perfected culture, chance would not exist. We would feel as if we were living in or acting out a fiction. When Roland Barthes published an essay on Twombly in 1979, he reached this conclusion, quote, meaning sticks to man, even when he wants to create non-meaning or extra meaning, he ends by producing the very meaning of non-meaning or of extra meaning. What is the non-meaning or extra meaning that sticks to Cezanne's wallpaper, or all the more insistently to every mark he ever set into a picture. The non-meaning or extra meaning is reality, just as Stella had said of his scribbles. Meaning sticks to man, Bart said. This is why it proves so easy to assign social or political implications to any work of art or any object of popular culture. We don't like the chanciness of reality. We like coherent fictions. We prefer to live in a fantasy world of our own cultural invention. As if by compulsion we order the world, whether by inventing religions, inventing sciences, or inventing critical theory. When Cezanne's art seemed to turn to abstraction, critics of the day needed to give it social significance. They needed to save it from meaninglessness, to save the abstraction from its own distraction. This wasn't hard to do. The socially oriented critics regarded Cezanne's art as the sign of a retreat into isolation. This probably encouraged the spread of anecdotes about his personal idiosync idiosyncrasies. The failure of his art to refer coherently to the immediate cultural environment and its established themes, this arch modernist move in the direction of abstraction and all its ironies, came to signify a social protest against modernity. Modern art against modernity. Charles Maurice, who was Gauguin's liter literary collaborator, 
and one of the most astute of the early commentators, stated specifically that Cezanne's art was a social protest. Actually, the painter did complain about modern mores and technologies. In this respect, he was on the conservative end of the range of social attitudes characteristic of his era. He was a great artist, but a bit of a crank. One day, when Twombly was viewing a painting of his that he hadn't seen for many years, he said of one of its many curious details, how it got there, I don't know. Perhaps it got there the way reality gets into life. Reality is distracting, and to the extent that art mimics life, distractions make their way into art. When writing about Twombly, Roland Barthes alluded to the factor of intuition, the human mind's capacity to work with a logic beyond that same human agent's potential to understand. Bart describes the feeling this way, I know what I'm doing, but I don't know what I'm producing. Cezanne was recording what he was seeing, but he didn't know what he was seeing until he had recorded it. And then it was too late to take the abstraction and the distraction back out of it. Is this not true of everything that we do? Were the causes of our chance effects? We not only generate our organizing fictions, but we generate our distractions. An artist at work on a picture doesn't know the picture that will result. Life is better this way. And when you write, or merely speak a sentence, or think, you don't know the conclusion until you reach it. Thank you. I'm not sure I've had time to quite formulate this question, but I'll shove off into it anyway. Um, it seems to me that in the process of making paintings that uh, I'm aware of things that are illegible but meaningful, as opposed to things that are illegible and meaningless. But at the point of making something, there's a simple act of faith in that moment. You can't explain the difference between the Ill illegible but meaningful and meaningless. Um, but I wonder if the, the moment of Cezanne or that, that particular moment in French painting and, and, and modernism was a period of special faith or investment in illegibility as a source of meaning f of meeting. That I wonder if we, if we haven't actually moved into a different place culturally now because I notice in teaching art that there's a lot of emphasis on justifying the, uh, the art product that I think would have been regarded as hilariously instrumentalized by the artists of 1900. I, I just wonder what you thought about yeah, that. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think we, we have gone in a different direction. So the, um, I mean, the cultural context that would have made, uh, uh, provided such a tolerance for um, instability of meaning or, or an acceptance of things that may or may not, uh, uh, um, let's say, solidify into something um, would be, you know, loosely we'd call it the symbolist environment. Um, in uh, literature, I mean, somebody like Mahler May, um, in the um, literary world, um, and uh, there was a lot of uh, interchange. Um, I mean, even in um, even philosophers like Peirce and Bergson were theorizing this this kind of ungraspable sense of things um, without being religious about it necessarily. Um, 
I think that because we're, uh, uh, the past few decades at any rate, have been so obsessed with justifying everything, if we want to put it that way, it's made it extremely difficult to understand what somebody like Cezanne was doing. Um, so we, you know, we have a lot of people uh, providing explanations, but I think most of those explanations are very wrong-headed, even if they make sense. I mean, you can take the, ultimately the work of art is a dumb object. It does not have to speak to us. We can talk to it and, you know, imagine we can, you know, bounce our words off it and imagine they're coming back from the painting. And a lot of writing is like that or coming back even from the artist. Um, so we, we, we do, t I'm sure I'm projecting my interests onto the things that I study. We tend to do that. Um, and I do, I do think that um, we have, uh, because of a, a change of cultural temperament, that we've lost a lot of our access to artists like Cezanne and Van Gogh. Um, I, uh, there isn't, um, I don't think there's a great deal of profound writing about Twombly, um, but uh, Twombly is an interesting, I mean, a, a lot of the artists who interest me are, you know, very abstract, uh, you know, and, and uh, they don't introduce words. But Twombly is uh, an interesting figure because he is so literary in so many ways, but he's also extremely abusive with regard to the word. I mean, he takes the meaning out of it very often or um, acts as if he can only find the meaning in the poem by writing it out, but he doesn't write it the way a poet would write it. He writes it the way a painter would write it, and it becomes a very hybridized kind of experience. And that makes him a very interesting artist. And maybe, uh, and he was relatively ignored for a long time. I mean, now he's a great hero. But um, maybe he's uh, appealing right now because he offers a kind of access to, he's kind of halfway, he's between worlds in, in a way. Um, a very physical kind of painter, but but somebody whose work you can um, interpret in a very literary way, if that's the only way you're comfortable. Um, I did. Um, uh, I do feel that um, the. Um, the intellectual abstractness of so much of the art that's produced now um, is countered or let's say compensated for by a subtly increasing sensitivity to the materiality of immaterial things. So um, I mean it's why I had the um, image of the TV test pattern on the poster, um, if, you've, if you've seen the poster, uh, because um, uh, I, if I were to give a very long version of this talk, there would be a part in there about um, electronic communication. And um, television, early television is especially interesting, early radio also, because it was crude by our standards. Um, but the, um, the test pattern image is, is a very visual thing, but it's, a, it's electronic, it's on the screen, and when it's whole and complete, it's useless. It serves its function only by um, interfering with itself because it records interference and tells you what's wrong. But when everything is right, the test pattern is mute and doesn't do anything. So the it's a case where the correct image gives no information and the incorrect gives, uh, does give information. And uh, of course, uh, so much of 20th century art, or the, let's say the, from pop art to now, especially, is deeply ironic, so ironic that in its uh, mode, I mean, because it's uh, rehashing things, it's commenting on things, it's, um, it thinks it's subverting things and so on and so forth. So that's all uh, work in, in an ironic mode. 
and um, um, it, um, I'm not sure where this thought was going. Um, it, well, it met, yeah, What's that? You're balancing out intellectual abstraction against something. Intellectual? <laughs> you are balancing out the intellectual abstraction of the current moment against something else. Yeah, against, right, against, against the, uh, exactly, against, against the physicality of, of other forms of art. And, um, and um, it's, it's, hard for, it's hard for you to take physicality seriously if you're in an ironic mode. So um, even body art, most of it tends to be have an ironic uh, feature to it. So uh, the things that um, performance art, the things that um, are critiques, or, or let's say that, that use the most physical kinds of materials, like using the body, end up being somehow critiques of the body. They end up being about the cultural construction of the body instead of being about the body. So where is the art of the body? There might not be any, because all of the art of the body is about the art of the body. And that's, the, that's an ironic mode. Um, and uh, you, in, in dealing with um, the, it's very Benjaminian of me, I suppose, but if, in dealing with the early instances of new technologies, you're often at a point where you can take the technology seriously in a kind of dumb way before you begin to ironize it. And um, at a point where there is no commentary on that thing because the thing is, in its infancy, it's too new. So Cezanne's son could copy from his father's sketchbook with no irony whatsoever. Cezanne could not do that. I mean, he'd be dumbing himself down. Paul Clay uh, worked from his child's drawings and worked from other children's drawings. But he had to be very self-conscious in doing that. I mean, it was a device. He was trying to force himself into a different mentality. But when we study this, we can't, it's hard to write about this without um, speaking of great cultural ironies. I mean, the same thing whenever we deal with some kind of cross-cultural borrowing. It's an ironic mode taking from the other. Hi. The Barth's essay that you quoted a couple times. Hello? Um, about the Barth's essay that you quoted from a couple times, because doesn't he insert a um, sense of, um, or I don't want to say attribute a sense of irony to Twombly when he talks about this as graffiti. Well, yeah, he do, he does. I mean, the the Bard essay is um, it's a strange thing because all of his factual material he got from Robert Pincus Witten in that essay, um, and Pincus Witten had. So, so Bart has a rather, I mean, brilliant writer, and it doesn't matter that he didn't have the greatest. Inf I mean, Pincus Witten's essay is wonderful, but it's it's it has its own limitations because it is uh, largely based on one meeting with Cy Twombly, in which Twombly talked very freely, and then Bart took that information and kind of ran with it and developed it in a very Bartesian way, uh, which is fine, but it's, it, um, I mean, in pulling those quotations out of Bart, I felt like Bart, because what I was doing was using it for my own purposes. In other words, my use of Bart there is not a commentary on Bart. It's a commentary on the situation of Twombly. Twombly's, I mean, Bart's use of Pincus Witten was not a commentary on Pincus Witten, whom he didn't even mention, but it was a use of that material for his own purposes. But, but I'm, I'm still curious about this idea of it being graffiti, if that's anything you uh, 
agree with or? Well, good, I mean, I mean, Bart referred to the, I mean, Bart, uh, in that essay, he starts off by saying something like it's, you know, so it looks like childish scribbling, you know, to people, but it's much more than that. And he, then he goes on from there, right? Yeah, but my point is that it, that the graffiti, we don't think of as a childish mark, but rather a really violent sort of. Um, well, I, I don't think they're violent either. They're, they're, um, but in a way they are certainly not childish, and that, I mean, Bart didn't want them to be seen that way. No, but he, he sometimes suggests that it deflates like the classical names or the Greek references in a way. Well, t I mean, Twombly is full of classical references yeah. and, and always, always was. But the, um, um, I, I mean, we'd, I'd have to return to that essay and, and um, I think I'd have to read it sentence by sentence, which I haven't done for a while. But um, the, um, I mean, it's 1979, so, um, uh, Bart and Bart is very French oriented, so he would have Dubuffet in his mind, as uh, Twombly probably did at a certain point himself, and he would know that the you know the the what Twombly's doing might be seen as a kind of oh there's another crazy artist trying to be a child, but uh, one of the things that um, well two things that I think are key to to the way that Bart argues there that he borrowed from Pincus Witten were that Twombly worked in the dark, at least at a certain for a certain period of time, to train himself to draw in a less controlled way, and that Twombly cultivated a left-handed look. And Bart meant that in a kind of figurative sense. And there's a long history of artists switching hands in order to do the same thing. And also a long, a long history of drawing in the dark to do the same thing, um, or just closing your eyes and drawing, or looking to the side and you know not looking at the surface. Um, and um, so he he developed that um, that sense of in Twombly a sense of a break with uh, conventional practice. The um, I mean, the reality effect material, as you may know, comes from a different essay, yeah, so. So this might be a little uh, simplistic as a question, but I'm thinking of this pair of drawings that you showed of Cezanne and his sons. And I believe that you said that Cezanne's drawing was fairly representative and, um, um, and that you thought the son's drawing showed distraction or boredom, which may be the same thing. But I was wondering, uh, first of all, um, I think there's a high degree of abstraction already in Cezanne's drawing. Um, and so it would seem to me that a child, and of course I don't know how old this kid was, but that maybe the fact that the, um, that it kind of uh, phases out towards the right, assuming that he started on the left, is because he just simply couldn't read these very, very abstracted trees that his father drew. And so that would, to me, be a very similar process that then what we see in the rest of Cezanne's contemporaries, or indeed in the contemporaries of any artist who is a little bit ahead of his time. Um, people don't, um, people cannot read the images because they are not familiar with the language. And the reason it seems so difficult for us to understand now is not that we are so much more intellectual than Cezanne's contemporaries, but because we had the benefit of seeing these things so many times. Um. Yeah, I, I, I basically agree. Um, the, um, 
the son getting bored, I mean, that was um, the curator's interpretation. And uh, based on, but, you know, it, I mean, if you have to interpret something, it's a, I think it's a perfectly okay thing to say. Uh, alternatively, one could say what you've just said, that so what the curator thought was, okay, this seems to capture this decently. This captures this okay. And over here, it just kind of falls apart because you don't get the same sense of the rhythm. But of course, to you're right, to the child, this might have looked like nothing. So how do you render nothing? This is as good as anything for rendering nothing. Um, what, the, what the curator thought he saw was a kind of, if only because this is denser here, more intensity, and that's why he, he used the phrase fading industry. No, but, but who knows? Um, but the, um, um, and it's a, a point well taken that um, certain things, of course, would be inaccessible to the child's understanding, and we are the children when we're dealing with something that is new to us or we don't understand very well, which might be artworks that look very, very strange, like Frank Stella in 1990 still looks strange to most people, um, and might look just wonderful in 2030, when, when it seems to have, when we've grasped its syntax or whatever it's got uh, working for it. I often think of late Frank Stella as because people just don't like to work. Most people, uh, yeah. And then I'll uh, get back there. Yes, um, you discussed, I think for me, for the most part, the experience of the artist and then society and sort of culture as two sort of opposing forces. But I was curious as to what you thought about what happened when they intersected. Um, for example, idea as a catalyst for experience or an artist's reaction to society as a catalyst for experience, or maybe a part of his phenomenology, or, or his or her phenomenology? Well, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's certainly, you, you, there are uh, great moments when um, social forces and artistic forces seem to have worked together. Um, one of those moments would be the early um, Russian revolutionary period, I guess, when um, you had a, um, uh, factors of design that really permeated the visual culture in a very productive way and seemed to correspond to the drive for modernity. But that, that was a fleeting moment. Um, and uh, there are certainly, uh, f you know, maybe for every artist who isn't very intellectual. There are two who are intellectual. Um, Cezanne was himself very learned, but not probably not what we would call an intellectual. I, I mean, he knew a lot, and he wrote poetry, and um, he was pretty well read. Uh, but when it came to his art, he didn't want ideas to be attached to it. Um, and. Um, it, it just varies a lot, and uh, you know, it, uh, part of it is temp temperamental. Um, what is interesting in terms of the art history of it is, uh, since art history is so often dealing with reception, is how, let's say you take uh, a non-intellectual artist, how is that artist re received at a certain moment by an intellectual audience? And that varies a lot. And it probably varies historically. So, you know, you can have situations where intellectuals are not interested in art that doesn't have ideas uh, readily connected to it. And other times when that's the only kind of art that seems to be good. Um, what about the gray areas between the two? Those extremes? Well, you either l lose w both ways or you win both ways if you're in, in between. There was, there was a question back there. 
I'm the, uh, the guy who came to this lecture to hear about Jim Campbell. <laughs> and um, I wanted to ask about Jim Campbell because it was I was in interested when you were talking at the end about these moments of abstraction being actually part, the moments when the artist is distracted from the overall system of representation, or they're, they're distracted from an overall model. And it occurred to me that maybe in a machine-made abstraction, like you see in Jim Campbell, it's kind of the opposite or inverse of that, um, where it's actually the overall system imposing on the image that creates the abstraction. But um, of course, in, I, I mean, in his case, the the mechanism are, are you? You might be saying what I'm thinking here is that in his case, the mechanisms are themselves distracting. In other words, they uh, you've got. Uh, imagery that's easy to look at, found imagery or, you know, home movies and things like that. Um, but the means of projection is very peculiar and it converts this very ordinary imagery into something that's problematic, analogous to, you know, maybe photo, good photorealism did that in whenever, 1970 or something. Um, I suppose even, I mean, good pop art did that with imagery from popular culture, um, somehow expanded the perceptual information that you could take out of it, um, and made something that wasn't distracting into something that is distracting, if, if that's close to what you were suggesting. Well, I was more interested in what you would suggest. So. What I would have argued, or yeah, oh, uh, that I mean that's that would violate my uh, your, pre uh, your previous yeah my no one would my, be my in previous that. resolve. Um, I just I mean I've sort of said it. I mean I I think that his work is is very interesting in the I'm the, well you know lots of art does this. I think that his art does it in a an unusually deep way. Um, in part because he really understands the electronics that he's messing around with. And it's not just, um, you know, playing with the technology, but it's, um, there is a, a kind of um, reworking of the technology. And, I mean, it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, when an, a painter who likes to use acrylics recognizes that you can do something with the skim on the top of the can the paint can, uh, because it's become plastic. And you can do something with that. Um, uh, that that um, there's a, a dimension to the paint that is uh, going to expand its possibilities. And um, Campbell's work um, expands possibilities. And um, both with regard to the electronics that he uses and with regard to what we're actually able to see. Because there are uh, his, these three-dimensional grid-like things that he sets up, are they, they really violate what you think you ought to be able to see in terms of programmed LED lights. Um, in, in the uh, case of most other artists who use LED displays, you see exactly what you would expect to see. I mean, so the words are different, but the mode of display is the same. But um, in his case, you've got electronic art that is messing with the electronics as well as messing with your view of the world. You know, so, you know, maybe um, electronic engineers hate him. I don't know. I guess since I'm holding the mic, um, I'm curious, well, since you bring up the issue of um, Clay and sincerity and uh, his naiveness, I, I'm wondering what you think of an alternative view, which would be Greenberg's view that Clay didn't really need to play at being naive because he came from an old provincial town in Switzerland. <laughs> and that there was something, um, there was kind of something objective about it and that, um, 
you know, is kind of like the horror of modern art, right? Or maybe not to us, but maybe 100 years ago, more horrifying, because there was something objective about it that the, um, the past, this like old folk town, or like the past that should be dead and gone is actually still persistent in some way. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that Greenberg had said that. Um, it is parallel to what he tended to say about other major figures, because he liked to say that they fell into doing what they did, as opposed to setting out to, you know, like having a program and figuring out what they had to do. He didn't, he didn't like artists who figured things out. So, I mean, that's, that's why he was al he always had reservations about Matisse and Picasso. He thought they were both too calculating. Or maybe he even thought that, an, that artists who were that successful must be too calculating. Whereas somebody like Pollock kind of fell into it and did the right thing um, and surprised everybody. You know, a Pollock could, could not be predicted. Whereas um, uh, French culture, according to Greenberg anyway, it high French culture, it could predict Matisse. European culture, Spanish, French could predict Picasso. Um, so maybe he liked the fact that then that Clay was from a small town. I didn't know that he was. And that would be a very Greenbergian kind of argument. It also, you know, reflects his social prejudices. I mean, he, he sometimes thought of himself as provincial because he um, spent years in Norfolk, Virginia. And, um, and uh, you know, sort of worked his way up to culture. It wasn't given to him, so that that might be part of it also. Um, but I, the last thing, uh, so I, that I would say with regard to that is that uh, I think that a lot of successful artists are uh, people, or at least in the modern era, are people who do have a capacity to tune a hell of a lot out, and. Um, that, that, and that's why distraction is interesting because, you know, you could say, well, there are people who are able to concentrate, but sometimes there are people who are not able to concentrate, and this allows them to tune a lot of things out because there are so many things going on at the same time for them that um, what they end up doing cannot be predicted by the context because it's as if they're immune to the hierarchies. They don't understand the hierarchies. 